So this is indeed about uh, property graph queries, PGQ, in an analytical database, and that's indeed DuckDB. And this is work together with uh, my then master students, Daniel Tenvold and Daphne Singh. Daniel is, by the way, in the room, and he is now a PhD student, together with Gabor, the master of ceremonies here. And it's all happening at the CWI, the Dutch National Center for Mathematics and Computer Science. So there are three main reasons, and this talk is a short talk, and my main motivation is to make you open up that page and read my or our paper, um, just six pages. And the three main things that you will find in there is an explanation of yeah, the why and what of SQL PGQ. SQL PGQ is this property graph query extension that's going to be included in the SQL 2023 standards in June. So learn about SQL PGQ, that's one thing, one motivation. The second one is the paper talks about um, 12 rules for competent uh, uh, graph database systems architecture. This is against the backdrop of my opinion that there is actually quite a few uh, graph database systems that are not so competent yet. And um, the third reason uh, to read this paper is to learn about uh, how you could possibly integrate graph query processing in a relational system and specifically in DuckDB. Um, yeah, so yeah, what is graph data management? It involves working with connected data and typically many to many relationships and um, yeah, tables, even if you have tables, by the way. So people think maybe that uh, graph database is only for, for social networks or telecommunication networks. No, uh, graphs are everywhere. You just have tables very often and they connect to each other, they join with each other and it's, this also follows, follows graphs. And then if you want to do kind of, um, um, yeah, query or analyze these graphs. What are the important functionalities? Well, there have been interesting surveys. Uh, Semi also wrote a very interesting survey about that. What people are doing, what the functionalities people are using in these uh, cases. And uh, they require typically pattern matching, pathfinding, and all relational operators. So um, these are ingredients of, uh, yeah, of the, what you would actually use in queries. Now, I told you, okay, very often you just have tables in maybe 99% of the cases where there are graphs about people are not using property graph technology or RDF, they are just using SQL. And how would you store then uh, uh, graphs? Well, you would have tables like a uh, person, well, back to the social network example, your persons who are following each other. So follows would also be a table and that would be a connecting table and end to M foreign key, foreign key uh, relationship. Uh, P1 connecting to P2 here, but it could also be a, a one to end relationship like a person lives in maybe simple primary key foreign key relationship. And then um, you might want to ask a question just similar to, uh, to Semi's question, uh, count the number of people that Bob indirectly follows who live in the city of Utrecht, which is a city in the Netherlands, and then we get back to Thorsten's talk. Um, so we get one of these nice uh, recursive uh, queries, which consist of, uh, what did you say, Q1 and Q loop, I think, Q1 and a union of Q loop, okay, so you see them here, so you see uh, the, the first part is Q1 and the Q loop is the, is the lower part, and uh, yeah, Thorsten likes these queries, um, but you also see is that even though this is not a path query, it's actually constructing a path using wonder or oh wonder, an array, a SQL array, just to concatenate all the vertices you have visited. Why? Because if you do this on a social network, there will be loops, there will be cycles in the social network. If you would just let loose this query without checking for loops, it would never finish. It would continuously find new well, stuff, um, not good. So you, in this case, uh, you, you do these things. Now, okay. so. Some people like these, like to write these recursive queries in Tübingen, um, but um, other people might find these queries rather long, difficult to understand and uh, write and maintain. And this is one of the um, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, graph query languages have been proposed. <laughs> Many of them have been proposed. Um, you see, uh, well, all the, actually, it's interesting. All these different systems they have different query languages so that's also why there is a tower of babel uh, uh thing that um uh, I, uh, picture there now as an aside these different uh these are these are examples of of, of uh, native uh, graph systems and i i gave this keynote last uh, year EBT keynote uh, you can look it up on my twitter feed um the story state of graph database systems and um, yeah this title says it all um so um 
I'll go into the details. One of the things I talk about are the, in this keynote are the six blunders of graph database systems architecture. Um, no time now to go into that, but you could uh, look it up. What is my analysis of the field, of this field? It's actually a niche field. The graph database systems have established themselves, but it's a very small part of the, of the database uh, management field. So they have a foothold. They have a foothold in this uh, use case that you see there. But uh, the solutions out there are not very competent, so there are maturity usability problems still around. And now SQL is proposing to do, I was talking about pathfinding, pattern matching, and these are the two things that are going to be included in SQL under the PGQ, SQL PGQ better. So if that would be even more success, I think this is going to be a threat to the uh, already small area of, uh, of graph database systems. So um, yeah, that's my, uh, my take. So, so they better become more competent quickly, otherwise it's going to be really, really difficult. So what is SQL PGQ? So, um, so it, it kind of makes you uh, define views. So you say, okay, I can, see a, I can see a graph in my tables. So it's like a, a graph view over your existing tables where uh, uh, you have that yeah, graph is V comma E. So V and E would be uh, both tables, uh, a, a, an edge table, a vertex table. And then the, even if, if you do anything special in the property graph model, uh, these entities, vertex and, uh, and, and edges, they, they can have a label that would be the table name. So the person table would then person would be the label of these vertexes. Uh, and uh, properties, that would be the columns, and the property values would be the, yeah, the, the, the column contents. Um, yeah, and then it offers this read-only operations on these uh, graph queries. And the, the, the reason how this came into existence, we have a bit of a connection to that because I'm also the founder of this LDBC organization. LDBC started to collaborate on benchmarking originally. Then later, we landed the fact that it's hard to define benchmark because there are no query language. So we started to talk about query languages. There was this G-Core uh, proposal where Neo4j and Oracle already got together. Later, Tigergraph also got involved and that became, we established a liaison with ISO. And from that, actually, this ISO committee that actually defines SQL started defining this uh, new query language. Actually, two, SQL PGQ is the first one. There's also a second effort called GQL, which is a superset of PGQ. Will come out later. Um, anyway, back to the example. So we would have these tables already talked about it. So now what PGQ allows you to say is um, create property graph, which is basically some kind of create view in most implementations. So create property graph with, with a social network, and then you name your vertex tables and your tables basically, and how they connect to each other. And then you have to find your. But there is more. You can you can actually specify which columns become properties and which not, but by default, all the columns are properties. Okay, so now if we go back to uh, the example query, how would you express it? Well, in much shorter text, of course, um, you see there, um, okay, what's interesting, so match, and match is like this cipher-like uh, cipher -like syntax, with the, the round uh, parentheses, they, are, they match nodes, so, so vertexes. And the square ones, they match edges. And you also see clean star there, the follows star. Actually, the star is outside. <laughs> in Cypher, it's inside, but OK. Um, and so this is like a match clause. And what it will give you, it will give you bindings of these variables, p1 here, and uh, c, and p2. Actually, this query finds all the combinations. Well, p1 is actually bound to only, um, no, uh, to only one node, supposedly, Bob, if there's only one Bob. Uh, but you will find all the P2s that are indirectly reachable uh, who will have to also be living in a city called Hydra. Okay. So in the end, you will have a three, three table, uh, three column binding table with P1, P2, and C coming out. And that's, but actually, these, these variables, P1, these are, this is a vertex variable. It would be an entire row. And that's where there is this columns clause that where you can actually, because a row is not a scalar value. So the columns clause allows you to say, okay, from P2, I want the field ID, I want the property ID, and then you have a scalar value, and this can actually be a list. So this columns clause tells you which columns will come out of this uh, match uh, uh, exercise, and that's all read in the beautiful syntax construct graph table, and uh, that beautiful construct goes in a from clause. And in a from clause, you can just put, well, any relational table, you can join them together, you can 
This has an alias GT, so you can join G to other tables with normal generational joints. You can aggregate them, filter them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, so we started implementing this or thinking about how to implement this in a real system. And of course, at CWI, uh, Hans Müller Eisen and Mark Rasfeld uh, developed a yeah, impressive, uh, a DocTB impressed certainly for its adoption, which uh, is going uh, through the roof right now. Last month, they had 1 million downloads on PyPy alone, and it's only part of the downloads. Um, and of course, you can learn more about uh, DocTB because Hannes is going to give a keynote on Wednesday morning. Um, yeah, it's very popular data science, uh, but it's actually, it's an embeddable database, analytic, embeddable analytics, you can use it not only for data science, but for many other things. Uh, there is also two startups, uh, CWI, uh, Hannes and Mark started the uh, DocTB Lab, a CWI spin-off, uh, and we also kind of helped create uh, ModderDuck, uh, which is a new startup in the United States that just got uh, funded. And... Um, but I will be actually spending a sabbatical in the next six months. Um, yeah, so there's, there's all kinds of things uh, happening around uh, DocTB, but one of them is this uh, integration of PGQ. And our strategy here is not to make it a core feature of DocTB, but actually leverage the extensibility features of DocTB. I kind of talked over it. It's, DocTB, DocTB allows scalar to use defined functions, parser extensions, but also scan, new formats, for scans for new data formats and table returning functions. So DocTB has quite a few extensibility features already. You can make extension modules We're going to use the parser extensibility and the scalar UDF specifically. So what happens is that uh, when you do this uh, new uh, with the parser extension, they create a property graph statement uh, we'll add metadata, we'll just remember this view. Um, and then when a query comes, um, this uh, query is actually translated. We translate this query, which is SQL PGQ query, SQL with the PGQ extension, into a SQL query without PGQ extension, but that calls some specific UDFs that we have added to the system. And that way, uh, this uh, module can remain relatively independent of the core uh, core um, uh a repo, which is a very, very fast moving repo, by the way. So um, we did not want to fork DocTB, for instance. So one of the things that happens in the for pathfinding, well, actually for pattern matching, we currently just rely on relational pattern matching. So we translate pathfinding to joins. Okay, obviously, eventually we want to have advanced joins algorithms like worst case optimal joins like Kuzu has. Uh, but we have, don't have those yet. Uh, for path finding, so for finding the shortest path or the weightest shortest path, we actually construct an, an, a CSR, which is this vertex array and edge array that positionally point to each other. So it's a very compact representation of a graph. We use uh, scalar UDFs for that. And the nice thing about using scalar UDFs, it's a simple solution and it gets automatically parallelized because scalar UDFs are so simple. Uh, you just get WDB parallelism out of those. Um, yeah, and, um, and and this is then created on the fly. Then this is also very update unfriendly. This is a very dense data structure and array. You cannot really update it, but because it's created on the fly, we don't need to update it. Uh, and then we run this uh, MS BFS algorithm that was invented at TU Munich uh, at some point um, on this. And the gist of this uh, algorithm is a very fast, low overhead um, uh, pathfinding algorithm that that keeps state so for every search. So like if you just do a bread first search, you need to remember one thing, one bit, which is have you visited this vertex, yes or no. So for every vertex, it has one bit. But the gist of MSBFS is that it then says, oh, now we can actually do parallel searches, not one search, but we can do 512 searches in, by keeping 512 bits in one register. Okay. So then you can do 512 searches and you share memory access. So the memory access that you do navigating the, the, the graph structure, you do not, now do not do it for one search, but you do it for 500 searches. So you do 500 times less uh, potentially of it. And you also leverage these SIMD instructions that, uh, that are quite powerful uh, in modern CPUs. So it's about like you, uh, this search, where does it start here? So it initializes two starting positions. Uh, it has a visit and a scene array. So visit is what you have to do next and scene is what you've seen already. 
and at every iteration you you set new bits okay and but this happens completely well in one integer really uh, at one very wide SIMD integer so the slide that says last slide um okay so what should you really remember from this talk um maybe not so much just that you are going to read this paper uh, and why would you read this paper well in less than one page, it explains you what SQL PGQ is. And you should be thankful to us because we read the spec. The spec has already 200 pages. You have to piece the meaning. It's kind of Oracle style uh, formulated uh, spec text. Um, so it's, I think, way more, uh, well, way faster to just read this one page. The second reason is that I have these 12 golden rules that came out of my EDBT rant uh, on, on, on competent graph database systems. And they are also summarized and motivated in this paper. And you can also yeah, see how we, uh, we are leveraging WBX sensibility for this, uh, for this project. Is it available already? No, we are working on it. SQL 2023 is not available either yet, but we hope, we hope to make it available when that is launched. Uh, may or may not take that. And there is many avenues for future graph database systems research. Well, factorized query execution, factorized with NFE, worst case optimal uh, joins and their optimization. It's actually non-trivial to integrate these in the arsenal of join algorithm in a sensible way because you also need statistics and good queer optimization for that. And uh, there's also lots of things to do in pathfinding, optimizing, uh, integrating pathfinding and queer optimization and better parallelism pathfinding. And that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much.